Lanka has fallen, it's facing its worst economic crisis. Their currency has crashed, their people are struggling, food shortages, power cuts, medicine shortage, and even school exams has to be cancelled because they just can't afford to buy paper. And after a violent protest from the people, their president, who was once hailed a hero, had to flee the nation. And that's how much of a mess they are in. Since then, some experts have pointed out, what happened to Sri Lanka should be a warning to many Asian nations. Wait, wait, you're not talking about Malaysia, right? Could Malaysia become the next Sri Lanka? To find the answer to this, we have to first understand what actually happened in Sri Lanka. In 2009, the country ended its 26 years long civil war. The president at the time, Mahindra Rajapaksa, chose to rebuild the nation via foreign debts. And since 2010, the country has slowly accumulated a huge amount of it. Having foreign debt is not really a bad thing. Actually, many countries fund their growth via foreign debts. But the problem lies with their execution. Instead of choosing to strengthen the economy, industry and exports, the country focus on providing goods to its domestic market. The result? A trade deficit. Which means the country imports more than it exports. In simple words, the country is buying more goods and services than it is selling it. Okay, think of it in the personal finance terms. It's like a person who spends more than he earns. So what do you think will happen? Uh, bankrupt! The government also started building its infrastructure, or more like bling infrastructure, vanity projects that are often financed by China, like the Matala International Airport that sees few planes land or take off, the Hamban Tota Port located in one of the busiest sea routes with tens of thousands of ships passing through, but only drew 34 ships to dock in 2012. The Lotus Tower, supposed to be the tallest communication tower in South Asia with first class facilities, but it remains out of operation until this day. All these are but a waste of money. Aside from this, the country was ruled by one family, the Rajapaksa family. Mahindra Rajapaksa became president in 2005 and since then turned the government into a family business. Brothers, sons, cousins, nephews, in-laws and other relatives joined the government and occupied top administrative positions, controlling most of the government finance. Check a balance. Well, that's literally thrown out the window. Going back to the economy, tourism is one of the most valuable players in Sri Lankan economy. It was heavily contributing towards the employment generation, forex earnings, as well as ensuring a steady supply of revenue to their government. But in 2019, they faced a horrific terrorist incident, the Easter bombing, which resulted in the death of more than 200 Sri Lankans and 45 foreign nationals. It marked the beginning of the collapse of this industry. Since then, other countries put up travel advisories to warn their citizens not to travel to the island nation. And then shortly after that, COVID came and their tourism industry was forced to a halt. Needless to say, the country's revenue and foreign reserve fell into a bad shape. On top of all this, a series of mismanagement from the Rajapaksa family, I mean the government. They made things worse when they implemented a series of tax cuts with the objective to fulfill election promises, which further reduces the country's revenue. And then they made another fatal mistake. Their government decided to ban the import of chemical fertilizer making them the first country to fully implement organic farming. But the problem was, their infrastructure was not able to support this implementation. So, needless to say, their agriculture harvest dropped severely. They had to import rice to feed their people. And as if things are not bad enough, the Russian-Ukraine war broke out, leading to high inflation for food items. And US was increasing interest rate, leading to a stronger USD, making it much more expensive for Sri Lankans to import food. As a result, the people are not just staring at an economic disaster, but also on the brink of starvation. And that's the story of Sri Lanka. But what about Malaysia? In my attempt to answer this question, I thought it's probably good to start with getting the opinion from someone who really knows the economy of Malaysia. Our finance minister, YB Tengku Safro. Recently, there are articles that actually come out and say that Malaysia debt is at a level that's very dangerous and there's a very high chance uh, that Malaysia can end up like Sri Lanka. So, uh, eh, quite scary, right? Let's look at the financial first, right? Malaysia uh, versus Sri Lanka. Okay. So, for Malaysia, uh, what is our total debt? Um, so, our total debt is 1.045 trillion ringgit. But usually, you don't look at it in uh, uh, absolute terms, you look at it as a percentage of GDP. Our total debt to GDP is around 63.8%. The statutory limit is 65%. So we're still below that. And what's more important is that 
97% uh, of our debt is denominated in ringgit. So we're not exposed to foreign currency uh, movements or mm. interest rate in other uh, countries. Now compared to the Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka debt is higher. Uh, debt to GDP in Sri Lanka is 107.2% of the GDP. If you look at uh, Japan, Japan is higher at 263.1% of GDP. And our friendly neighbour in Singapore, right, it's about 182.8% of GDP. So what this shows is that uh, debt levels does not necessarily indicate that a country is at risk of becoming bankrupt. You know, but what important is that we are need to be able to pay uh, for the debt. But if you look at the other point is that inflation rate. Um, Malaysia inflation rate, as you know today, is around 2.5 percent. Right, uh, recently announced we are expecting between you know between two to up to three percent. But what is uh, Sri Lanka? Sri Lanka is now at six percent. And also look at reserves. Our official reserves, right, our uh, central bank official reserve, is at 116.9 billion US. What is Sri Lanka's uh, national reserve? Three. 1.14 billion uh, US. So I think making those uh, comparison between the two countries should also realize that the main issue and about debt management is about our affordability uh, and also debt sustainability. So when you compare Malaysia and Sri Lanka, you need to look uh, at the balance sheet and see whether the comparison is right or not. So don't worry, uh, we not we won't be like uh, Sri Lanka. Well, one thing for sure, Malaysia's economy structure is quite different from Sri Lanka. First, Malaysia is a trade surplus country. This means our export value is higher than our import value. In personal finance terms, it's like we are earning more than we spend on buying things. So that's a good news, right? Then unlike Sri Lanka's economy, which is mainly dependent on tourism and textile industry, Malaysia has got a diversified industry that supports our economy, such as the oil and gas industry, glove manufacturing, palm oil, and electronics manufacturing. Many of these industries are considered essential products and services that were allowed to continue operating even in the midst of COVID-19. Now, I can't say that our government is fantastic. It has its flaws and there are those areas that I may not agree with. But to give the credit where it's due, our government did do better than Sri Lanka la, during this pandemic. Despite the dramas, they were able to allocate resources via the budget to help Malaysian economy to recover. Some of it, which I thought was a pretty good idea, like the MyStep program, which provides a short-term employment program for youths in GLC and government agencies. I mean, it's not permanent employment, but at least these youths get to have some exposure in these companies. And if they perform well, maybe they could be offered a permanent position later, right? There's also the Charming Kerja Wage Incentive Program, which helps to subsidize the wages of workers so employers can continue to hire or at least no need to lay off their workers during this tough time. At least our people can still make a living. There were also initiatives like Samarak Niaga, which provided financing for businesses via government guaranteed loans to ensure businesses don't close down during this tough time. There are also others as well such as a location for cradle, education and so on. Anyway, you get the point. There are efforts that are trying to get the economy back on track. However, like I mentioned before in my previous video, for these initiatives to be truly effective, it comes down to execution. And I do hope that it will be executed effectively to bring the desired growth for our nation and our people. So, the good news is, we are quite strong when it comes to our industries. And we are unlikely to become like Sri Lanka, at least not in the near future. However, this doesn't mean that there's nothing we can learn from what happened in Sri Lanka. In fact, it's important that we learn from it, or else we may end up on a slow cruise towards disaster. The first thing, to improve Malaysia's food security. Do you know that despite of us having such large agriculture land, our food supply is actually imported? Yes, we actually don't produce enough food to meet our own domestic requirements. This means that if one day we can't import food in or if becomes too expensive to import food, we could be in big trouble. Just like what's happening right now, when USD strengthened, we had to pay more to import food in, and therefore your food price inflation. Personally, I think it would be great if our government roll out more policies to boost our agricultural sector. we got such big lands, right? And we also even have University Pertanian Malaysia, and we were one superb in agriculture. So we can do this again, right? And for those of you who are thinking about starting a business, maybe you should really consider going into the agribusiness. Although farming may not sound very sexy, but you're doing a great favour for Malaysians. And the truth is, it is actually a huge concern globally. So you may end up attracting a lot of investors. By the way, for those of you who are interested in agribusiness, do you know that there are these programmes called Pembangunan Commodity and Subsidy and Incentive for Pertanian and Perikanan? Go and check it out and help us to build better food security in Malaysia, please!
Second, when we look at the failure at Sri Lanka, it actually wasn't so much about their debt, but rather how they use the money. Sri Lanka actually spent a lot of its money on building infrastructure or bling infrastructures. You know, things that don't bring any economic benefit. Other than that, they also provided a lot of goodies to their people excessively, simply to gain favours for election. So what happened is, the money was not spent effectively. It wasn't being used to grow the economy, but rather just spent. That's why it's very important for Malaysian government to spend our money on areas that can contribute to economic growth, such as education, so that our people can be more employable and more prepared for the fourth industrial revolution. And then spend on economic sectors like startups and entrepreneurship. That way we can build more profit-making business and even create more jobs for the people. So don't just spend money blindly to make the rakyat happy and gain favour. The most important thing is use this money to stimulate the economy, to boost the economy and help people in building businesses. Finally, on the area of corruption and mismanagement. Well, one good news is this. At least our government is not dominated by one family like in Sri Lanka. But we still do have some check and balance in our government. Anyway, the point is not to bash the current government, but to point out the importance of eradicating corruption and mismanagement. I believe it's time that our government implements serious measures to curb corruption and mismanagement. Because when this kind of thing goes on for a long term, it can really bankrupt a country. Besides, if our government are able to reduce it, I believe we'll be able to save up a lot more money. Then there's a lot more wealth that can be shared around. I believe if we can learn from all this, we Malaysians can have a bright future and perhaps become even better than Singapore. And that's my two cents. What do you guys think? Tell us in the comments below.